Hi, everyone. Today, we're going to be talking about Halvorn's short story, which is set in 10th century Norway, and it's called The Slave and the Trolls. It is a frame narrative about a prisoner who is told by his captor a story with three trolls. You can read it on Tapas. Links are in the description. Today, we're going to be talking about this story in depth and talking about the various inspirations that Halvorn has had while making this story. And we're going to be exploring not only a visual art inspiration, but also some musical inspiration, as well as maybe literary influences as well. So um, how do we, how do you want to start? How do you want to talk about how your experiences were like when you finished the story? Because as I understand, you wrote the story a few years back, but then you revisited it, it this year and last year. Yes, that's true. This is one of the stories that I wrote, I think, four years ago, and uh, I I edited it a bit in order to uh, to post it now because there were some things I was not really pleased with, uh, and it is also longer. So <laughs> yes, but I, I improved it quite a bit, but I haven't changed much. I mean, it is essentially the same. I just added a few paragraphs, I think. Mm -hmm. What can you tell us about the style of the story? Uh, well, like you said, it is a frame narrative. So we have a story within a story. And uh, the outer story, the frame one with uh, Aswald and his prisoner um, is a realistic story and it's more psychological. But then the the core story, the one that Aswald is telling is quite fantastic because it deals with a slave who runs away from his master and uh, he has a nasty encounter in the woods with three trolls. Mm -hmm. So that there is quite a big difference between them and I was exactly aiming for this contrast because I wanted to uh, um, to to depict the stories in medieval folklore which involve a lot of supernatural and also to give a hint of you know how medieval people were more superstitious I can say and more eager to believe in the existence of supernatural creatures than we are nowadays so this is what I wanted to to show. Mm -hmm. I think this is a recurring theme in Tales from the North because in Holm Gong, which is a story with Hakon, he also believes in a lot of supernatural things. <laughs> yes, that's true. Some of my characters are more superstitious than others. And I can say that, yes, Hakon is, is one of those who believes in the existence of water spirits, <laughs> because the woman he encounters, he believes to be such water spirit, yes. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us more about the trolls in the story? What are the trolls in medieval Scandinavia and how accurate are, you know, cultural perceptions of the trolls, you know, especially since we see a lot of trolls in fantasy and historical stuff, but how accurate is it compared to what trolls actually were portrayed as in medieval Scandinavia? Mm, I think that the answer is going to be a bit unexpected in that Trolls in medieval Scandinavia are supposed to be unknowable, but nowadays people are so uh, eager to put labels on, any, on everything and uh, describe everything. So we sort of see them as a, a separate species nowadays with certain characteristics. But this mostly stems from later folklore, so not from the Middle Ages. And it was mostly, um, it's mostly rooted in uh, 19th century depictions of folk tales. So uh, this image of the, the big uh, hairy creatures with large noses, such as we see here in the amazing illustrations of John Bauer from uh, the Swedish folk tales. So uh, I really love them and they have influenced me a lot in depicting uh, my trolls. But what I wanted to show in my story is that um, 
medieval people did not really see them as such. And I will give you a short example of how trolls appear in a saga. So there is this scene where a group of men of warriors are walking through the woods and suddenly a troll crosses their path. So the troll is not described, nothing happens. It just crosses from one side to the other of the road. And everybody is, uh, is petrified, you know, and they don't talk about it and they just say, okay, let's go on. And then uh, two of those people die. So what we see from this is that the troll is a symbol. It is an omen of something terrible that is about to happen. It is not depicted as, um, you know, a, a separate species or someone who, who does something, right? It is, it is an omen. And it's interesting because medieval literature in Western Europe is often very symbolic but, uh, and full of allegories, but saga literature is, is really not like that. So um, it's quite an out of the ordinary occurrence. And interestingly enough, there are trolls. Uh, I mean, trolls are mentioned even in the law code of medieval Iceland. And it says something like, um, you, are, you are forbidden to have supper with a troll and you are forbidden to wake up a troll. So <laughs> this is in the law code. So, are we to understand from this that medieval people are so superstitious and so disconnected from reality that they actually believe that these fantasy creatures uh, live among us? Or maybe the trolls are something different and they are not supposed to be separate creatures. And we see that um, often in sagas, people are called trolls, or evil people especially, or witches are called trolls. And interestingly, um, there is another um, sort of being that's called a troll, and that is the, the zombie, which is called Draugr in uh, Norse myths, and they are called trolls as well. So this is interesting because troll is mainly uh, beings who have some supernatural inclinations and who use these powers to do harm. So not really a, a separate species. And um, Professor Orman Jakobsen from the University of Iceland describes trolls as uh, similar to our modern conceptualization of aliens. So we don't really imagine them as little green men, right? N nowadays, we have so many representations of aliens from more abstract to more, I don't know, animal-like, insect-like, or not, not necessarily humanoids. And trolls are supposed to be the same. And um, he says, Professor Jakobsen says uh, uh, about that fragment that I quoted before, the troll is ominous. It is also unknown in that story, in the saga. On one end, we have the known, the human life, safety, civilization, and the audience itself, which is represented by the group of men. At the distant other end, the occult, the inhuman, death, danger, wilderness, and the extraneous other. The troll has to represent all of these things. It is danger, death, and the vastness extending beyond the human grasp of the world. Mm hmm. I see. So it's a symbol for a lot of things like the great unknown, the concept of the great unknown, maybe a little bit like Moby Dick. Yes, I was just thinking about this when, when we were discussing. I haven't thought about it before, but yes, exactly. Yeah, just like Moby Dick. Mm hmm. So it's not really like what we see in fantasy, you know, this very clearly, obviously different species of humanoids that have a certain number of attributes and look a certain way. There's no way to really distinguish what is a troll. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So in medieval Scandinavia, no, it's really not like that. Mm hmm. So how are they represented in your story? In my story, I represented them very different from each other. And especially uh, to because I wanted to show that I did not see them as a species or Oswald, the narrator of the story, does not see them as a species, but rather as creatures of nature, of the wilderness. So this is what they represent. Um, they, they are creatures of the forest 
And um, this is why they hate civilization and they hate humans. And because they are ancient creatures, they also hate Christians because <laughs> Christianity is something that was only recently in the 10th century introduced to Scandinavia. So um, it often appears in, in later Scandinavian folk tales that trolls and other creatures of Scandinavian forest, like Nykr that we mentioned, or elves or everything, they are representations of paganism. So they often in these folk tales, um, also these one in, in the book that I've just shown, they are uh, somehow, you know, dispel that they go away when you pray or when you go to church they're not allowed to enter the church and things like that so i also in my story uh showed this antagony between trolls and christians the christians being the slaves the the prisoner of asphalt and also the slave who is running through the woods mm -hmm. is the slave connected to a certain character from sons of disobedience Yes, I think, I think he is. I think he is. Yes. Mm -hmm, because so, that certain yeah, character so is also is also Christian, right? Yes, exactly. Yes, because the uh, the the new additions to the slaves in uh, the story are both Christian and they are brought from uh, from England. So yes, I'm actually going to uh, to refer to this in uh, Sons of Disobedience to this incident. So it will be really interesting to see a different take on it because it will be from the point of view of the prisoner. Mm, I see. Mm -hmm. Because this prisoner knows Aiden, right? Mm, yes, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah so, so we we're going to hear more about, about what happened. But uh, don't worry, the mystery is not going to be spoiled. So what exactly, how much of Aswell's story is real, that's really not going to be spoiled. It, it's a different perspective. Mm, I see. But I think we will find out um, what, how he reacted to Asvald's story, right? Yes, yes, that's definitely yes. Mm -hmm. So apart from medieval literature, what inspired you in the way you created your trolls in this story? Um, like I said, uh, the illustrations of John Bauer were very inf influential for me in terms of art, because uh, they're so wonderful and they, they so beautifully portray the mystery of Scandinavian woods. And uh, actually my, my very good friend who uh, uh, gave this book to me as a gift uh, many, many years ago, uh, told me that there's, there's no Scandinavian person who walks through the woods and sees rocks and trees and formations in, in the shadows and doesn't think of trolls. And I thought that was so beautiful. And it's actually one of those things that, that inspired me in creating this story, because this is exactly what happens in, in Asphalt's Tale. And uh, uh, there are many wonderful depictions of, uh, of trolls in this book, but one in particular that uh, I really loved is one of them where um, they are represented. Okay. I don't know if you can see it. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's a troll under a tree. And in other places, there are trolls that look similar to to rocks or not look similar, but that can cam camouflage very well uh, among rocks. So this is one of the things that I also used in the story. And we also have knickers in this book, but uh, the knicker is a man. And um, that, that's one of my favorite stories. So I love the way, the, way this, the style in which it is painted and the way uh, these creatures are depicted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like the, the creatures are a bit cuter than you would usually assume from this kind of thing. Yeah, I think they are uh, a bit goofy in later Scandinavian folk tales. So they are not really evil. They are maybe misunderstood. Mm -hmm. How about the Moomins? Are they trolls? Yeah, I, I think 
I mean, they have they have some characteristics, <laughs> physical at least. So yeah, maybe they are. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they're definitely supposed to be, but they do not look like John Bowen's trolls. Uh, they aren't hairy in that way. I think they are not as humanoid as uh, other representations. Mm -hmm. Oh, and also I'm going to uh, to share with you some uh, uh, pictures um, and uh, I'll have to ask you to enable screen sharing oh, right, uh, so yes. I can show you uh, some other images and uh, well contexts in which trolls appear which are um, metal music, Scandinavian Viking and folk metal. So I'm going to show you, this is one of the, uh, the artworks of one of my favorite bands, which is Fintroll. And yeah, we do have a very fantasy like troll, the, the, like the ones that we see in video games, perhaps really strong and full of spikes and leather and metal. But also you see that um, the horns are animal-like, and then we see the ears that look like twigs. So I really love this representation. Female troll, and from the album Trollhammeren, and yeah, uh, the king of the trolls, and Scandinavian woods. So this is one of the bands that, as you can see by the name, they, uh, they are uh, a Finnish band that sing in Swedish. And um, this is another one from the band Monegarm. Um, Vreden Steed means time of wrath. It is also a Swedish band. And we can see the troll uh, destroying a church. And here we also see that element of paganism versus Christianity that is often represented in Scandinavian folk tales and in my story as well. So these are two of, of my favorite bands that uh, influenced me a lot in my stories in general, not only in this one with the trolls, especially Monic Arm. They have wonderful lyrics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can imagine the priest in that picture with the church and the giant troll as Edgar or the dean in the AU. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, that's very true. And that huge troll, yeah, would, would be terrible to see. So, uh, of course, uh, here trolls are mostly seen as negative characters, I think. I mean, not in Fintroll, because Fintroll is from the point of view of the trolls. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So... Yeah, I can really see that influence in your art, especially the shading on the rocks and everything. That really reminded me of the certain troll that you did, who is who, lo who looks like he's made of rocks. Oh, yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And there's also that kind of mysticism and the whole idea of trolls as nature spirits. Yes, yeah, I really try to render that. Mm -hmm. So Asvald is also a character in your novel, Sons of Disobedience. Is this incident with the slave and the trolls referred to in there? Mm, yeah, it is. And uh, like I said, we're going to see it from the point of view of Aiden. So yeah, we're going to learn more about it and about asphalt a lot more because here he, he is kind of a, a very mysterious character. We only see him in the shadow. So there is only one moment when there is some, some light cast upon him. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I think we're going to be talking about Asvald more in the upcoming podcast episode that comes after this one. But for now, um, I guess Asvald in general is kind of like an antagonist, as we said in the podcast preview. So he contrasts quite a bit with Hakon in that respect. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Uh, Hakon is... is quite a positive character. He is for the most part one of the, the good guys in my stories. So yes, they're very different. And uh, as we will see in uh, my short stories from Tales from the North, um, we will see a lot of very different protagonists. So we have Hakon who likes to play the hero and he likes uh, sporting fights. And then we have Asvald who is a really dark, evil-ish kind of guy and uh we're going to see well 
the next one is from the point of view of one of my Christian characters, which is Edgar. So we're going to see a lot of different protagonists and of course, not only male protagonists. Um, so very different people. Mm -hmm. I think with Edgar, it's going to be quite the contrast since he doesn't approve of anything in this story. Oh yeah, that's true. <laughs> Fortunately, he doesn't meet these people because if he did, he really would not like them. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> He's a bit like the Dean. Yeah, quite a bit, quite a bit, yes. <laughs> so what was the most difficult thing to write in this story? Well, I was concerned about my representation of Christianity. And I think that a narrator with controversial views is always challenging to depict, no matter what those views are. And like I mentioned before, uh, Asimov is one of my most anti-Christian characters. And I wanted the reader to understand that the narrator's views do not reflect the author's own views or the general tone of, uh, of, of my writings, because uh, my story is placed in uh, a period of transition, which is Norway's conversion to Christianity. So I want to depict very different viewpoints. And this is one of them. Uh, we had to have one of them that is um, so anti-Christian. So because Asphalt is a young man who has heard that Christianity is sort of an, you know, uh, looming, a uh, terrible thing that is going to happen and an imminent danger and they have to fight against its installation in the country. So the only Christian of whose actions he actually knows, he's heard about is uh, King Olaf Tryggvason, whose actions are, well, uh, Quite, quite terrible because he, uh, he converts the country by turning uh, people against each other and torturing those who refuse to convert. So it is only natural that a young person who has, you know, just grown up into this world when everybody's talking about, oh, wow, Christianity is coming, we have to do something. He would have this perspective. Mm -hmm. That makes sense, yes. So how did you solve this issue? Um, by describing Christianity in Asphalt's own words. And this is something that I had not done uh, in my first uh, version of the story and something that I added now. And uh, it was a bold move, I think, because this put it in, in an even more negative light. But what I wanted to do is for the reader to understand that that is Asphalt's story, story and viewpoint. And if it is biased, it is because he views it as such. So uh, uh, Aswell doesn't, you know, mock it, but rather sees it as a threat and respects it as such. And he, he clearly describes that uh, he dislikes the people involved in it and considers King Olaf as a representative of those because that is the only one that mm -hmm. he knows. That makes sense. I think that's very good advice for people who have to tackle such controversial topics in their works. Mm, yes, yes, I, I, I hope it is because I, uh, I think that I found uh, a satisfactory solution to that problem that uh, I was really concerned about before publishing it on Tapas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah. In our next episode, we're going to be talking about the character of Asvald in more detail. Yes, exactly. I'm looking mm -hmm. forward to it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye. Goodbye.